now I want to get into, I know personally that this is your, your other most favorite thing and your favorite tool that you mentioned earlier. And I want to get into tarot. Welcome to the Me Middleton Show, a place to encourage neo spiritualists to laugh, love, and learn. While we virtually walk through topics of the spiritual, magical, natural, and occultic worlds, I am your host, Evina. You have now entered the Me Middleton Show. What is tarot and and where did it come from? Can you get some history about tarot? Yes, they do. Yes, they do know a little bit about the history of tarot. Um, so, okay, tarot is a set of playing cards that is used as a form of divination. Um, it's a way of telling stories that illustrate what could happen if we continue down the path we're on right now. So the future, as you know, is not set in stone. But the tarot, like when you ask it a question, it's illustrating what will be if we continue, and it tells the story. So it's, that's why yes or no is hard with the tarot. Not impossible. It's just difficult. So it started essentially in Italy. We know this. And it started in Italy in this um, 15th-ish century, century or so. Um, it became a way for nobles to keep themselves occupied uh, because it was just the major arcana at that point, although it wasn't called that, but that's essentially what it was. It was just the 22, like, personality archetype cards, various various things. Mm-hmm. So they were just kind of played with them, and they were, like, kind of telling stories in that way. And it evolved over time, and what we understand to be the tarot today came uh, to the United States with um, – with, I don't want to call them gypsies, but essentially what we would think of as a gypsy. That's, they essentially brought all sorts of occultic things to America. And um, in the late 1800s and early... Evelyn loves tarot. <laughs> in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, we got the, um, the Rider Waite deck, which we should actually be referring to as the Rider Waite Smith deck because uh, Smith was the woman that illustrated all the tarot cards. She was the one that created the modern tarot deck, essentially, as far as the illustrations go. And they, by this point, the minor arcana was already added in, but she gave meaning to each individual card. And the, um, uh, the author of the cards, who they decided what the meaning was, Wait, was the, he was the author. So he, like, had this vision, and then Smith brought it to life, and then Ryder was actually the publisher, so he was the publisher that got credit over Smith, the artist. So we really should be calling it the Ryder Waite Smith deck because we don't want to forget our lovely lady who illustrated everything. So that's kind of where Carol came from, like a really broad stroke history. Um, it's been around for a really long time. It's only been used as divination for a few hundred years, but that's that's a long time. That's not in the box to box your teeth at. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where it came from. So originally it was just playing cards just something to do to keep nobles occupied right but so how did it become spiritual how did it go from just something to do to a spiritual tool it's kind of mucky because during that period in general all over the world the history wasn't um recorded super accurately um, whoever, there's an old phrase that whoever won the war wrote the history books. Mm-hmm. Essentially what was happening, like we don't specifically know exactly when it started to be used as a form of divination, but it did. By the time the 1700s rolled around, it was considered an occultist gypsy witch thing um, that fortune tellers were using. So it's kind of somewhere in that gap of time, someone started to realize that, hey, I can use this to commune with God, or maybe they, I, I'm sure they weren't using the words higher self or spirit or whatever, but essentially they realized that they can use this to pull out messages from the other side. Mm. And of course, back then, that was, you know, as devil as it could get. <laughs> Like, that was not considered to be a good thing. And then, of, of course, the Christian church was already running rampant at this point. Like, this was long past the Crusades and um, the fall of basically every other religion in, well, not the fall, but, like, the um, 
overcoming every other religion, essentially. So Christianity was the main religion at this point in history, and the Christian church didn't like it. Um, so that was another reason why it's still considered so taboo and close to the devil, but it really isn't. It's really just a form of speaking to our higher selves. And I think people in history just started to realize that, that they didn't need the priest to tell them things. That's just my own interpretation of how, from studying where his, where Carol came from. I guess I don't know for sure because I'm not actually a historian. But I think it became a spiritual tool because people realized that it was accessible to them. I see. Okay. That part I didn't even know. I told you how many decks I, I have. But that yeah. part I didn't even know. Though what I did, what I do know is like how it transferred over here. But I didn't know about how it was like it was just something fun to do, and how it kind of translated or transformed over time into divination tool, and how it evolved. So well, I was going to ask why is it so powerful, but I I can see how it became powerful. And I think that's with any entity, the more people that put that give it energy, the more powerful it becomes. Absolutely. So you got so many people across the world that utilize this tarot and other uh, divination right. card and any other divination tool, and the more they give that energy, the more powerful that. I know for me, when I first got into tarot, I was going to put that thing down because I'm like, I can't learn this crap. How am I supposed to learn every single card? So how difficult is it to learn each card in the deck? How difficult is it to learn your entire multiplication tables? The people feel as though they have to memorize the, quote, correct meaning of the, of the cards. And that, um, that is problematic for a lot of reasons because, first off, art of all forms, and that's a, a tarot, a huge part of tarot is art, is the meaning of the art is always within the eye of the beholder, which is why tarot decks are so diverse because the, the, whoever created the deck is giving each card its own meaning. So I don't think it's necessarily learning what the cards mean. It's learning what your deck has to say. Because even if you have the Raider White, Rider White Smith deck, <laughs> right. it's, uh, interpretation is going to be different for each person. There, Yes, there are general meanings for each card. And a lot of those play into the, um, the numerology. Uh, the different archetypes that the major arcana represents and the different areas of life that the suits represent. So if we focus on just learning the meaning of the major arcana to start off with, it, what helps me to learn is that it's telling a story, right? Um, so the fool is card zero in the major arcana, considered the, quote, first card of the, of the deck. And the fool is traveling, meeting all the different archetypes. And it, it's telling an experience, a life story story, a life journey. And so that helped me remember what each card was. Like for example, there's the devil card. I think the devil is like 16, I, I believe. Yeah. After, uh, and then if, if that card comes right after temperance, which temperance is about moderation and abstinence. And then the devil is about overindulgence. So you can see how they relate to each other. Exactly. And another, another example is the tower. The tower is about things falling down and, and chaos reigning and great sudden change. But then the next card is the star, which the, um, the star represents hope and all things brighter <laughs> on the other side. So I think understanding that there's a story will help learning the card names a lot. And also under having a basic understanding of numerology will help with the minor arcana as well because – each number in the different four different suits of the minor arcana essentially represent the same thing. Like for example, all aces, all four of the ace cards represent a beginning of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. and that, that flavor is going to be a little different depending on what suit we're talking about. Um, but all the aces represent a beginning. All twos represent, you know, a decision, a partnership, a fork in the road of some kind. And then we tie that in with what the suit represents. Um, so swords is the scary suit, right? That's the, <laughs> it has a bad reputation, but that is the suit of of emotional change, and that's the air suit, so a lot of intellect. So mm -hmm. the, the ace of swords represents the beginning of something potentially difficult emotionally, 
right? Um, so that is kind of a basic way to start understanding what all the tarot cards mean. And then, of course, the best way to learn is to just keep practicing. Um, and also, something I want to throw out there is you can't rely on your guidebooks forever, right? Like, you have to look at the symbolism of the card. Like, that's – I always try to do that. I mean, I've been reading tarot for a lot of years, and I still – reference my guidebooks. There's a lot of cards and every deck is going to be different. But before you reach for your guidebook, you should look at the card mm-hmm. and see what the symbolism is. Mm-hmm. Like this is. Personally, I don't really like the super abstract um, cards that don't really have pictures on them. Like They're more like simple. Those don't really resonate with me because I like to look at the card and see what the, what the art on the card represents. Some people love the sort of abstract art on that. I think the art is beautiful, but like as a as a reading, I don't, that doesn't really work with me because I rely heavily on the symbolism of the card to tell me what the card is telling me. So I hope that makes sense. So I know with me, um, when you were speaking about the symbolism in the cards, right? And I told right. you I got, like, what, 12 decks maybe? Each card will be different for each deck. We're talking about just straight-up tarot. Like, I just told you that I have the Orisha tarot deck. And that is completely different from the, what I got, it's called, I'm looking at my decks now, the Psychic Tarot deck, which is also different from the Rider Waite Smith deck, which right. is completely different from, uh, where's my, oh, the, the Thoth deck. I got the Thoth deck over here, which is the, the Alistair Crowley one. And, um, you, the Priestess card, right? Oh, yeah. that is a completely different meaning in each of those tarot decks, just strictly talking about just straight up tarot decks. The priestess card, uh, which is, what's that, the uh, number three? Yeah. 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 The, no, the, magical priest. Right. There is the yeah. fool and then the magician or the priest. And even the names of them change. Oh, yeah, for sure. Within each one. It's, it's basically the same, but they do have different meanings. So if I'm reading a client with the the psychic tarot deck or a spirit telling me to get the thought stick, you know, the thought stick, one of those um one of those decks that says, I wanna say, is it judgment? It's not judgment, it's adjustment. I can't remember which one was the oh, difference. You know, I use the tarot of dreams and I love that deck. And instead of the hierophant, it's faith. See so it's- Similar, but different. Very different. So it's the illustrations within that particular system, that particular deck that I'm using that is translating what spirit is illustrating to me for that particular person, or even myself, for that particular situation, and depending on where on the spread it is located, right? Because um, it could be the same. Like, if I drew the card, this one same card for me, the priestess, we stick we're going to stick with the priestess. If I'm di- pulling that card out for me, it might say one thing, you know, talking about um, more of a cronish uh, way of, of motherhood. But for you, it might speak completely different. It might speak about the waters of, of it because there's waters in the, in the picture, you right. know. Or um, it might speak about, uh, am I, I hope I'm not getting confused between the priestess and the empress, where it's where she sits back, like she's in the background, but you can still see her. Or the outline, right. her, I, I can't remember, I might be getting them too confused in my head right now. But it speaks completely, di- same card, mm-hmm. but it speaks different. different for you versus for me or anybody else. So right. it's, I, I absolutely a thousand percent agree with you in so far as not relying so heavily on the book. You can look at the books for you know certain little things if you get confused here and there, but the illustration and understanding the journey, understanding what the meaning of the journey is from zero to twenty two, you know, and I, I mean a thousand percent of what you're saying, wholeheartedly agree. But my question to you now is. What is the difference between a tarot deck and an oracle deck? This is a great question. It's a million dollar question, really. So the I like to think of oracle decks as being super free flowing. There is no um, no customer expectation when it comes to an oracle deck. There is 
there is no standard in an Oracle deck. It's whatever the artist wants it to be. I've seen Oracle decks be as many as, you know, 120 cards Ooh. or as, as 20, and they can just be anything. Um, and a huge indication between an Oracle deck and a tarot deck is that an Oracle deck is going to have a lot more words on it. Like, I, I feel like I can't think of an Oracle deck off the top of my head that doesn't have, like, some sort of an affirmation or a poem or some kind on the actual card, and that just doesn't exist with tarot. Uh, so that's a huge indication. Also, a tarot deck, for the most part, follows the same structure. Um, right. There's, there's always going to be a major arcana and a minor arcana now. That doesn't necessarily mean that a tarot deck is forcing you to be in a specific box. I have seen people combine oracle and tarot decks or change the suits completely. Um, like I've seen like the suit of crystals or the suit of branches or like that sort of thing. And it's beautiful. It's, that's what makes it so diverse. And that's why it's so important to not rely on the guidebook that comes with it. That it's, the deck is what is the divination tool, not tarot. <laughs> so yes, an oracle deck is, is much more free form. It's going to have a lot of words on it. It's probably going to be a lot smaller uh, as far as the number of cards goes in a tarot deck. And a tarot deck is going to be at least 70 cards. Like, if it's less than that, it's not really a tarot deck, in my opinion. And it's going to be a lot more interpretive. Um, I feel like an oracle deck is much more straightforward as far as interpretation goes. Like, oh, I pulled the anger card. Okay, so I'm angry. <laughs> as opposed to the devil card. Like, why? what does this devil card mean? That's so... Yeah, I think of you can get a lot of the same guidance and just whatever is more com you're more comfortable with. I think, and I, I a thousand percent agree with you. But with the oracle card, I think you're right. It's a whole lot more reading with that one. With the, yeah. with the oracle cards, <laughs> a whole lot more um, to express in that. In those these oracle cards, I have. Um, the Sacred Earth Oracle deck. I have the Sacred Geometry oh, that's Oracle a good one. deck. Yeah, I love that one. And um, I can't find my or other Oracle decks. They're over there, way over there, too far for me. But I know that with the Psychic Tarot deck, if it marries tarot with the chakra system, and it doesn't use words like the queen of discs or the priestess like the card. They, yeah. they use some, I guess they, they utilize like what the basic word or the keyword of that card as the name of the card. And they, the decks, like, I mean, the suits, they don't use like swords or cups or anything like that. They use like the elements, water, air, fire, oh. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, to my point, I think that with the Oracle Day, it's just, as you eloquently expressed, that art is as art does. It's an expression, and it's interpreted based on the viewer or the person right. looking at it. And I think what the Oracle Decks allow the illustrator and the creators of these decks to do is to express themselves outside of the world or the realm or the rules of tarot. Right. Exactly. And I think that people are getting a lot more interpretive with tarot decks. Like you just mentioned, like they're using the elements and stuff. Like they want that creative freedom mm -hmm. to you know, have the art form, but also with a little bit of structure that the tarot is offered. That's why it's, I think it's beautiful that there's so many different types of decks you can find. It's, it's fantastic. We love the Rider Wade Smith deck. It's fantastic. But there's so many great ones out there. It's kind of like music, right? Yeah. You know, the, the grandfather, I'm, I'm a hip hop head. So the grand, the great grandfather of today's hip hop and being an old hit myself, looking at today's hip hop, I feel like how my parents and grandparents were about us when hip hop first came out. Oh, that racket y'all listen to. Now I'm look, looking at hip hop like, Lord, that racket, what is you listening to? That ain't real hip hop. But the great grandparents of today's hip hop is jazz. It's that, oh, right. that bebop, right. that skit and scat and, 
you know, the, those different automatopias of, of jazz back in the day, it gave birth to this wide variety of of the music now that came from that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's like what these divination art is, is art does, it evolves. And with these decks, especially Oracle decks, it allowed, right away was like the beginning, and look right. what it has created. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, because the rider weight put tarot into the mainstream, and if they hadn't done that, if she hadn't created the standardized meaning of all the cards, we wouldn't have, over 120 years later, the most amazing, versatile, artistic right. divination form. So she was, she is the unsung hero. Um, <laughs> yes. I believe her name was Carol. Carol Smith, is that right? Last name was Smith. She was great. That I mean, to me, she's like the god, the goddess of divination. You can use regular playing cards, like the cards you play spades with or poker with. You know, those with the heart clubs, diamonds, and spades. Those are basically the 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 wands, the swords, the cups, and the discs. It's just basically utilizing a deck of cards of whatever kind of deck of cards in divination. Uh, and I was given, like, the same cards you would play spades or poker with with the heart club diamond spades. I used that in divination. And um, it, it is used in divination. I got a whole book on, you know, how to use it. And I, I looked at that. Actually, that was my first tarot book, my tarot deck, was playing oh. cards. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I read this book. It's a very thin book. And it goes into the definitions of, you know, each card in each suit, Heart Club, Diamond, Space, which is basically the same as the, the suits in Tarot, the 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 wands, the swords, the, the club, not the club, the disc, and the, um, I'm missing somebody, the cups, swords, wands, somebody, I won't, won't miss them. It's basically the same thing. It's the exact same thing with the suits. I was living in El Paso, Texas with my brother, and one of his friend's wife, fellow army buddy, his wife, had her playing cards out, but she had it spread out in such a weird way. Now I know it was a a tarot spread. And I'm looking at her like, what is she doing? This is not, this is blasphemy. This ain't how you play spades. I ain't know no (laughs) better. And she was, she sat me down and she was like, no, I'm doing readings and I'm just looking at some things uh, on these cards. And I'm like, a reading? How you gonna read? That's a heart. That's a that's the ace of hearts. What you what you looking at it for? What what is it telling you? And she gave me the definition. I'm looking at her very strangely. So I said, okay, give me a reading. Story time. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, it's not a good. It was a great story, but it is it's not all smiles. So as she was doing the reading and she's telling me all of these different things, and I'm looking at her like. Oh my God, how you know that from looking at these cards? There was this one particular card. I can't remember the card, but it was an ace and it was in reverse. Uh And when she looked at it, she said, Oh my God. And she looked at me panicky, like her face was nervous. Like she wanted to say something, but she don't think I'm going to be able to take it well. And she's not taking it well. She is definitely not taking whatever she just saw in that ace card. She was not taking it well. And I'm steady, you know, trying to get her to tell me, what is this saying? What do you mean? She said, um, I'm really scared to tell you this. I mm, I don't know how you're going to accept this. So we can all move right along. So let's go to the next. I said, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Tell me what that said. She said, I think you're about to have a death in your family. And I'm like, Bitch, quit playing. So, now and she was trying to explain to me it could mean that somebody just recently passed away, like real, real recent, like within the month, or somebody's about to die in a minute. And I'm like, bitch, please. Why the very next day my grandmother passed away? Oh, I'm so sorry. This was uh, in 1998, though. So, and I'm stuck in El Paso, Texas. I'm trying to hurry up and get to Atlanta. The rest of that story is that's long and dreadful, but <laughs> got nothing to do with this. But when she said that, 
And at the moment when I got the news, I didn't put two and two together until well after I came back home to Georgia. And I thought about the the sister who gave the reading. Did you tell her that um, she was right? Oh, yeah, I did. Matter of fact, I'm crying. And the lady who did the reading, she was there. And uh, so I, you know, I told her, my grandma, daddy, grandma, daddy. Now that I'm thinking about it, that's, I noticed she kind of jumped and gave this look like, oh, my God. And it was more than, oh, my God, um, I'm sorry to hear about your loss. It was more like a, a realization kind of. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like, I just gave that girl that reading. <laughs> right. I mean, I, obviously, that's a horrible thing to happen. But I'm sure on some level you helped to validate her in some way. I did. Um, it yeah. was years later. I came here. That was I had a way to communicate with her. And my brother uh, gave me her phone number, and I called her, and... I tell you, she was such a, a, a breath of fresh air while, during my time in Texas because living there, honey, was, was a bit of hell. But I loved her. You know, there's nothing there's nothing you can say to me about her that will make me be like, oh, I don't like that bitch. She was a godsend for me in everything else. So when I spoke to her and I told her about, you know, what happened and how she did make me feel, but I told her I was grateful for that. And you actually taught me something. That's something I'm going to be learning and getting into. So you and my gateway drug, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, just want to make sure she was at peace because, you know, I didn't want her to feel like, oh, my God, this is so evil and so wrong. I need to put it down. No, baby, you, you're on to something. You taught me. Thank you. Right. Like, spirit genuinely came through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I'm very grateful for her with that. Um, yeah. And, you know, you kind of brought up something that I was going to bring up about um, using playing cards, like traditional playing cards as tarot, that you might be kind of sneaky about it. You know, like you're kind of at a point in your spiritual awakening where you want to dabble with tarot, but you're not comfortable buying a deck of cards for whatever reason. You just use a regular deck of cards. And, and nobody know what you're doing. Helpful. You're just sitting around with some cards. Right. I'm just playing cards, you know. I could be she playing solitaire for all you know. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm playing, I'm playing a, my own version of solitaire. <laughs> yeah, have you heard of Yu-Gi-Oh? The cartoon oh, Yu-Gi-Oh? Of so of my son, at the age of tw almost 27, he still utilizes Yu-Gi-Oh decks. He trades them and plays with them for some inane reason. You got to see this from my mom's standpoint. It's like, Lord, have mercy. But my son has actually utilized that deck in readings. I thought he was... The most creative, I, I was, you see how I'm talking, I can't even get it out. When I saw my son do I'm like, Yu-Gi-Oh cards? Show it, really? Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And that just further instills the fact that it's not necessarily what the cards are, it's what the deck is. I say, exactly. And you know those Yu-Gi-Oh cards, they're all kind of art in it with all the little oh, monsters God. and people in there and all the symbolism and the point values and things like that. My son threw that thing together. He utilized his own personal life and did reading. That's so cool. <laughs> I love that. I've never heard of anyone doing that. I wonder if you could do that with, like, all of those kinds of cards, like collecting collectible cards. Um, for, for like baseball night. cards or all these yeah. other different cards. That, wow, I'm I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's a gifted person out there that will look at it with those eyes and be able to come up with their own system. How special. Amazing. I love that. So do you have a favorite deck? Uh, you know, I'm kind of in the market for a new one, but I'm not, like, jumping on any immediate ones. The deck that I use right now is called the Tarot of Dreams, and I really like it. Um, it's actually one that my husband picked out because he wanted it for himself, but he doesn't, he doesn't play with them as much as I do. Um, and I really enjoy that deck. Um, the art is just gorgeous. Symbolism is really rich. Uh, but I've kind of been dabbling with maybe finding another one. And every, every time, every time I find one that I think I will like, I just, I hold off for some reason. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of in the market for a new one. I'm not jumping at it at a new one. There's another one that um, I really like. It's called the Children of Litha. Child of Litha, I think is what they call it. Um, and it's all animal based. Huh. It's, it's really beautiful. And I, um, there's a couple of other ones that I've just kind of come across, like other people using them. There's 
one that I got a reading done recently, and he was using uh, one that was all cats. And I thought it was super cute because I love me some cats. I've um, seen that one. Did the cats look like, like real people but with cat heads? No, they're like actual cats. Like Link was lying around. <laughs> Let me see. Um, i got to look that up now. Cause I think I've seen that one, too. I've oh. seen one where it's like bo- people body but cat heads. Like realistic cat heads, it's not like drawn or anything like that. And I've also seen one where it's just like cat cats, like you know, regular cats, but various types of cats. And, and I've seen one that was animated, not animated, but like drawings. You know what I mean? Like yeah, they're drawn. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of oracle decks that I want. I just have to budget carefully. But I, I'm really interested in. Um, there's like a goddess oracle deck where it's like all the different goddesses from all different cultures, and I love that. Um, there's Angel One. My favorite Oracle deck that I use is, um, is it called the Mystical Unicorn? It's a unicorn deck. And they're, because unicorns are like very special to me. That's like probably my power, my most powerful spirit, mystical creature connection is to unicorns. And I love that one. That's the Oracle deck card deck that I use the most for sure. There's lots of them. I think I'm in the market for one too, but, um, if I utter that out loud, my husband would definitely look at me so that way. Like, don't, no more, no more, don't bring no more. And have Santa bring them to you. Say what? Have Santa bring them for you. I know you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but baby, Santa got me this. He <laughs> you know, put me out the house. <laughs> Santa Claus is for me. I, I can't. It was the universe or something. <laughs> Girl, no, he'll put me out the house like you in these cards. I'm so sick of you in these cards. Because no, not only do I have decks, I have pendulums everywhere. And I use OB. And I'm not sure if you ever heard of OB as an African uh, traditional divination tool where we use either cowrie shells or we use coconut um, uh, shells, or we using um, cola nuts to to toss and, and just people they throw bones. I ain't learned that one yet. Um, uh, yeah, well, I, the African traditions are something that I don't know anything about, but I would love to learn more. I can tell you all about Celtic traditions because that's my background, but I don't know anything really about. African or really any other tradition. So that's really interesting. And see, and that's why I created the Me Middleton show because I study all of those, the, the Celtic. I mean, because oh. I'm as what brought me to Celtic the sciences is is the fact that I'm Scottish. Oh, cool. And I, I connected to that first. Okay, my the short story of my little story is. When I started in magical traditions, you know, I told you about the tarot deck with the playing cards, thanks to my friend in Texas. But when I really got into, like, magic, it was all Wicca. It was all Celtic. It was all Druid system. It was all of that. And um, and I illustrated this in one of my episodes in my podcast about, you know, you looking at what meat sack I'm walking in, but you don't know what spirit is dwelling in me. And I personally didn't know, but I was drawn to that. I was so deeply engulfed, like, oh, my God, this is me. And, but then I evolved from from that into um, shamanistic things, the Native American um, yeah. divination system and the spirit system. And then it grew from that to, to Asian stuff and it grew from that no before i even got into asian stuff i went into the left hand path looking at luciferianism and i I didn't go into satanism i thought it was stupid not scary i just thought it was stupid like that's just how i felt about it like this dumb (laughs) (laughs) isn't that crazy how all the different spiritual paths ultimately have the same core values basically even in the left hand path believe it or not Basically, yeah, like, for example, and I mentioned this in my podcast, too, people like to look at um, when it says, uh, basically, do as thou wilt. People yeah. people think that that's like giving you permission to act a fool and do whatever you won't do as thou wilt. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with, you know, personal development, bringing yourself to a higher standard. And right. um and doing away with the ego. Yes. 
have everything to do with that. But do as thou wilt. Um, it kept people saying, oh, I can do what I want. It kind of reminds me of the Second Amendment about gun rights. I mean, uh, it's, yeah. you wasn't living in the, uh, the 16 and 17 hundreds to understand what they meant by, well, actually 17 hundreds, to understand what they meant by that and what was going on in them times. They, we didn't even have a real form of military. It was just a bunch of people from different villages. They had guns. They had to have guns. Right. Uh, you know. Like we're actually going out and killing their food every day, and they needed it. They say that, yes. Right. It, it it had nothing to do with this other stuff today. And it just evolved into something retarded now. It's, it's the interpretations. Of how, it's like playing telephone. You know about the game yeah. telephone? And spirituality is the same way, you know, like the the way Buddhism was practiced, you know, a thousand, couple thousand years ago, five thousand years ago, is not the same Buddhism that we right. have. Oh, and girl. Overall, I think that's a good thing because we need it in our modern context. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense or it doesn't apply. Evelyn agrees with that. I, I know. I was about to say the same thing. She agrees. Yep. Yep. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to understand where your roots are. And I think that's important with tarot, too, because tarot wasn't always... A, a thing that was scary. It was a toy. It was a, a fun thing. And uh, you and I have talked about before how spirit has a sense of humor. Spirit is not serious. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. And, and you know, and, and tarot is such a popular form of divination. And it was, yeah, it was. It was a toy. It was something that <laughs> rich people played with. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's important to understand where the roots come from, but we need to understand it in our modern context. In tarot, the last few things I want to talk about is the spreads. Oh, yeah. Like, what are spreads? Like, who came up with this thing? Like, <laughs> what is this? Tell me about spreads. Well, for starters, spreads are optional. You don't need a spread. You can just do a one-card reading if you prefer. But spreads are what is telling the story of the cards. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that tarot is a, is a storytelling element that is illustrating the answer to a question or illustrating a path that we're currently headed down. Um, and so that's why where it comes from, where it's telling the future. But the spread is where is where the story part, the story element comes in. So most spreads, I mean, they're pretty free form. You can basically do whatever you want with a spread. But most spreads have... Um, an action element, an illustrative element, and like a more ab a more abstract element. So um, right, Evelyn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> she likes tarot cards. She likes to hold on to them. I think it's funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you're when you are doing the tarot spread, you're you're pulling a card that is meant to be in that spot. And that also adds a layer to how that card is being interpreted, right? And you don't need to do a spread. You can just look for general guidance. Like one of my favorite spreads is Mind, Body, Spirit. It's a three, a three card spread where this card is um, representing the mind, this card is representing the spirit, this card is representing the body. But another really common one that people use is past, present, future mm -hmm. or the situation, my role in it and what action I should take or something mm -hmm. to that. So there's a lot of, um, action advice type thing in a spread. But you don't need to use a spread to get the full spectrum of what tarot can offer you. Um, I think creating spreads is really fun, and I think people get intimidated really quickly with spreads because they see crazy things like the Celtic Cross, which is like a, like what, like 12 cards or something like that tarot spread. Um, or the World is another one that is like a dozen cards, mm -hmm. or really, they go on Pinterest and they search tarot spreads and they see 10 card spreads and they're like, whoa, what does all this mean? And that's pretty advanced, but you certainly don't need to do that. I mean, it's certainly fun, but that's not something you should be doing every time you pull out your tarot deck. That's not sustainable. If you only pull out your cards when you want to do a 15 card tarot spread, that's not going to to help you. What's way more effective is a three card spread, I think. I think three is the perfect amount um, of cards to pull for any situation, any question, because uh, you have an opportunity to get a couple of minor arcanas, a couple of major arcanas, or none, or all, or whatever. But it, it perfectly illustrates what needs to be done, where you are, where you're headed. 
Do you think that people who utilize those long, big, drawn out spreads and pulling out twenty cards to tell to give a reading, do you think that's just um their way of like milking it? Like to get more money? I think it's possible, but you have to assume that there are always going to be people that are don't have the best intentions. You know what I mean? Right. I think it depends because what my tarot readings that I offer people are three cards because I my goal with a reading that I offer people is it to be digestible and rememberable. Yeah, and people that do big spreads like that I don't think are inherently malicious, but I do think that. It gives an opportunity to make things more complicated. It's not as accessible. I don't think that's the intention, but it does it does draw things out. And I don't think it's necessary. I personally have only ever done like a big card spread like once or twice in my life because it's too much. Too much information. Can I? Right. I don't, I don't think they're helpful. Um, but if I were to go get a reading from a professional reader and they wanted to pull 15 cards, I think that's fine. As long as you're not drawing it out into a three hour thing, then I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's too much too much going on. It's it's just, it's it's a barrier to entry. It makes it not accessible. You know what I mean? I think I, okay, I'm it's kinda of like half and half as so far as what my experience when it comes to people who who do that. I think a lot of people are genuine. I think they're just yeah. You know, they want to, you know, go deeper and, and look into certain aspects or and, or they might utilize more than one deck. They might use, like, three different decks and they might oh, pull out, yeah. like, maybe three, four or five cars, depending on what cars jump out. Some cars just hop out while you're shuffling. And, um, and they want to look at it from three different um, decks. And that you might end up with nine, 12, 15 cars at, in a single reading. Um, I think a lot, a lot of them are genuine. They're not trying to, you know, jiggy out for your money. But there's some folks. I went to this one lady. Oh, girl. I'm like, okay, kill me now. Just go ahead and just end me because you you telling me way too much, and it ain't even because what the reading is saying. It's because what you doing. You way too much. It's like applying at job core and you 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 filling out you signing your name to a thousand pieces of paper just to say I'm going to job core or something they or joining the military and I'm signing a a thousand papers signing my life away that's what it feels like and I don't want to I don't need you draining my life like that you know how many minutes I just wasted I don't want to do this no more that's how they make me feel. And and it it kind of leads to like other things like you need uh, especially when I know better if if I was naive I would believe these people when they do a thousand card spread and then say you need some work done and that work is gonna cost you arm and leg and a piece of toenail and <laughs> I'm like well with all these cards you drew you didn't fix me. Shit, I think with all the cards, I would have gotten fixed. Yeah, you just touched on a really important point that a lot of these healers and psychics and readers, they yeah, tell you what's wrong, but they don't give you the tools. You heard what your baby did? She said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Evelyn. Yeah, she's like, hey, yeah, don't just tell me what's wrong and send me on my way. Right. Help me. <laughs> right. Hmm. Yeah, so common, unfortunately, I don't think people do this intentionally. I, I, it is hard because they deserve to be paid for their gifts. You know, they have their their uh, practices and they deserve to be paid, right? They also should be aware that you're not actually helping anybody if all you do is say, "Oh, yep, there, there you go. There's your issue. Have a good day." And a lot of them do that, right? Right. Right. Yeah, that's like, oh, well, I paid you for what now? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. I know. In my readings, I always think, I, yeah, you agree, mm-hmm. don't you? Yes. You said an additional podcast guest. <laughs> In my readings, I always try to give people, like, action steps. You know, I'm like, okay, so uh, like I had a client recently who um, her reading was overwhelmingly saying that you're giving away way too much. 
And I was like, okay, ma'am, like, you're giving away way too much. So I need you to do this, that, and the next thing to work on this. You know, I'm not wow. just telling you this and then you're just sending you off into the world. I, I need you to understand that you can fix this. And this is why, that's why the message is coming through is that so you can work on it. You know, the future is not set in stone. That's why the tarot tells stories. It's not telling the future. It's telling you where you are now so that you can, if you choose, change things. Right. And I try my best to encourage my clients to do changes. And I try to find the simplest changes because a lot of people really, first of all, especially if the reading is overwhelming, and the reading could be overwhelming with just three cards because a lot of people don't like, especially when it's like shadowy. Oh, for sure. And they they thought they, they thought they was ready for that, and it could be very overwhelming for them. And so I want to give them as best I could, if if it does not call for that, then, oh, well, I don't know what else to do but to tell you this is what it is, and this is big thing how to fix it. But I try to give them simple things. But at the same right. time, the the things that are simple, I guess I consider simple, it's very challenging for them. And it tells me if they do it, that you are really trying to fix your issue or straighten it out or take whatever advice that spirit is giving or you're either doing that or you think I'm some kind of novelty gig. That right there, you get cussed out. I am yeah. not about no one's novelty. I'm not a circus act. No, oh, girl, I hear you. Like, people often are like, oh, like, I, they find, I don't advertise to random people I just met or the coworkers that I talk to dead people. But as soon as they find out, they go, oh, well, what are they telling you now? And I'm like, nothing. Because, <laughs> I, because I don't have anything to hear right now. Like, I just, it's not, a, helping souls move over into the light is not a fucking party trick, okay? Right. right. <laughs> it's my life to work, and I don't, I don't make a mockery of it. And please don't mock me. Cause you would yeah, get exactly. you get all day cussed the fuck out. I bet you. I cannot tell you how bad that that gets to me. Yeah, I hear you. And but then the thing is, is that I turn around and go, okay, so why did this person cross my path immediately at this point in time to tell me this? Like, why? What is spirit telling me? Because I don't believe in coincidences or accidents or exactly. Or like, what did I do to attract this event? Right. Yeah. Am I am I self doubting? Um. Did or maybe do they need to hear something from me that? or something like you know there's always a reason and it, it kind of goes back to what you were just saying that if you felt called to get a tarot reading and you're not doing the work that i suggested then what that's that's just your pure ego right there you know because you felt called to get a reading from me at this moment in time for a reason and now you have the tools and and now falls in your court you know what are you gonna do exactly what are you gonna do hopefully something anything Oh, Lord, not just anything. Because <laughs> don't be yeah. honest with shit and then come back to me tell me some money some help. No, but wait, wait, we just went through this. Right. You made it right. worse. <laughs> and that has actually, I've had clients that have done that. And it's, I can't deal with you. I'll send you to somebody else and tell you good luck with that. I, I just, okay. does that mean, am I unethical? What is that? Because I have a limit. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Tolerance level is very short. I think it's, it would be unethical to, um, give people too many readings in one way, shape, or form. It's different if you're working with someone energetically, like from a Reiki standpoint. Um, like a weekly Reiki session isn't unethical, but a weekly tarot reading, I, unless you're pulling tarot cards for yourself, but if you were coming to me as a client on a weekly basis, I'd be like, mm, let me give you some skills to pull cards for yourself because your your reliance is not in the right spot. You believe that I hold, that somebody else holds the answers. You, you're looking outside of yourself for something that is within you. This Evelyn really agrees with that. Yeah, she's really in there. I, I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, she's like my, my cheerleader. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> interview her next time watch <laughs> watch yeah. so no I to answer your question no I don't think that's unethical if you truly believe that you can't help somebody it would be it would be unethical to try and help them right. that's when that's the bad rap that a lot of um, people in our metaphysical space get is that if I don't think I can help you 
anymore. Or I'm basically pulling the same cards for you every week, but I'm going to keep taking your money. Like that's that's not that's ethical. Funny. That's that's no. dirty. Right. And as far as like teaching them, to, look, let me tell you, uh, there's uh, someone I know, someone that teaches tarot every like quarter. <laughs> If they want to learn this, I either send them to her, or you know, or you're the expert too. Create a tarot reading class. I'm sure yeah. there's people that sign up for it. There's plenty of people that sign up for this sister's class. And um, actually, she she's a great teacher. I've, like I said, I've been doing tarot for a very long time, but I took her class last year. Last year, that was rolling into the top of this year, and from a um. What's what's the word I'm looking for? From a um, I don't want to say scholarly, but from uh, I guess a technical um, in in such a studious way. What's it's a word, and I'm not using the word right, but just for the sake of this show, and the way in which she's teaching it, and me sitting down being a student and learning from somebody else versus my self study that I went through. It she's awesome. She really was able what took me too long to get to know the tarot deck she was able to show us in a month and i wish i had um just to show us to show me how to teach tarot i mean how to utilize my decks many years ago she's great so if anybody just keep running to you tell me go don't take a class because this is crazy and it's almost abusive. It's almost like it's, it. It really tells me that it's a cry for help. Like you really need to see somebody else. You're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So. Right. Yeah, that's another line that is hard to not cross as a healer, where yeah. or as a life coach, really in general, because life coaches are about moving forward, right? And there's no regulation when it comes to life coaching, but um. Yeah, if if you are really needing some like counseling and some therapy, <laughs> you gotta go find that somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, right. and hopefully, the client understands when that time has come. You know. Have you ever had people who like, I guess, like needy in such a way, like they keep. Uh, they keep patronizing you and giving readings, but it's in actuality a cry for help or just needing somebody to talk to. And it's really something that's outside your realm of what they really need. Um, dealing with those type of people, did you? What was your? Did you have a remedy for that? Yeah, you know, um, I've had more people that weren't actually clients trying to do that than I have had will paying clients do that. Often people will message me because I'm always inviting my audience to come and talk to me because I do genuinely want to help them. And usually, like, my own boundaries, I will give people, like, like one free question, essentially, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better way of phrasing it. But, yeah, you can come to me, like, once, and I will give you advice. Or if you leave a comment asking a question, I will happily answer your comment. But beyond that, when that happens... I usually try to take it off a public platform. First off, that's my that's my first step. Is if it's like a YouTube comment or a Facebook comment or something like that, I try to message them privately because I don't want them to feel like their dirty laundry is airing out for everyone to see. But eventually, I'll be like, you know, why don't I would suggest, you know, maybe getting a reading or maybe paying someone to help you with with that healing. It sounds like maybe your your root chakra is blocked. Maybe you should get a clearing or something. It, I try to be gentle with them. I haven't had anyone be overly rude, although I do have medium friends who are constantly battling this, where people are constantly seeking free readings because they, it, it is just a form of a cry for help because they need help and they think that they think that they does, they're entitled to it, but not from like a nose uppity in the air kind of way, but more like I'm so desperate for help, I don't even realize what I'm doing is not okay. So it, it is sticky. But then, of course, you do have the people that know what they're doing and they're just trying to get free stuff from you, which that's in every industry. That's unavoidable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I, I just try to be really gentle with them and, and quietly suggest that, oh, well, if you want more with this, I can 
pull a few cards for you and we can go deeper. But I asked beyond the one question, really, I, I don't know how much help. Or maybe if, if they have a question, like question after question, I will direct them to some of my free content that I already have that already answered that question. So, I, th- but that's what I do. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I do what I do is to get those people the help that they need from a spiritual perspective. I haven't had anyone too crazy, like, trying to ask for advice on really critical things, like, I don't know, really emotional abuse or really bad physical health. Nothing like that has happened to me personally, but I have no other mediums that have dealt with that. And it's all about your boundaries. You know, I have really clear defined boundaries. So if your boundaries are faulty or if you're really, really empathetic and it's hard for you to set those boundaries, you can attract those types of people that will keep pushing and pushing those boundaries. Yeah, I've I've actually had uh, people who push some limits, whether if it was intentional or not. Mm-hmm. Like they really, really need some help, or you just got those um, very selfish, uncouth people who like to take advantage of you. Um, right. People who really need to see a psychi- psychiatrist or a psychologist, right. mental help, because that's I, I'm not a doctor in that way. No, no, no. And I would never recommend that you forego modern medicine. Ever. You know I, mean? I, yeah. I, I would never do that. But they need, mental health is just as important as physical health and spiritual health. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mind, body, spirit. And I think going to somebody, especially if it's somebody who understands spirituality, because going to just any old, well, you know, my environment, we call them shrinks. Just going to any old shrink is not helpful because they're really quick to give you medication. And that's why a lot of people are not so in a hurry to go see about their mental health because they don't want to take medication. Right. And, you know, that's a whole other bill. And they don't want to think that they're crazy, especially whatever they're experiencing is real to them. But if you have somebody, and I do too, I actually have someone like this, who is actually into spirituality in whatever form and metaphysics or whatever form it understands, they, they're they more able to assist those people on a spiritual level without, you know, giving them chemicals and things of that nature unless they truly need it. Right, right. And I like what you said about people immediately jumping to the medications when, of course, it's a case-by-case thing. Right. Like if you really need it, then you need it and you should do what feels right. But, you know, everyone goes through phases. And just because you're in a really depressive state right now doesn't automatically mean that you need a really heavy duty medication. Maybe over time things will change. But for me, I when I was in college, I tried to do exactly that. I tried to find like a counselor or someone that can help me. And they just immediately try to prescribe me Xanax. And I'm just like... You know, that's not really the help I came here for. Like, I, I really, I w- was more beneficial for me is to just to talk it out. And that's because I was self-aware enough to understand that. And whatever works for people is what they should do. And obviously, we're not doctors, so we can't speak too much to, to this specifically. But it is really helpful if you're able to find someone that can combine all these modalities, you know, like a like a spiritual counselor that's actually licensed. Like right. That. That is a, is a gold mine if you're able to find someone Ooh, that can do that. Yes, that is a gold mine. And boy, I tell you, that, that needs to grow. That type of thing needs to grow. And I, I call for that. I, I swear that would be, that would be a game changer. And there will be so many more people that will be more ready to, and wanting to get help. Like if they try people like us getting readings and things like that, and it's something that's a little deeper, and they're able to find someone on a who are spiritual, who are into metaphysics, and who are licensed, and they'll be able to help them for real, like for real, for real help help them. Right. Like what an amazing way to combine, you know, counseling, Reiki healing, readings, psychic readings, energy healings. And life coaching, imagine how unstoppable you would be, how many, how you'd be able to help so many different people and give them exactly what they need. And well worth the money. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you could worth $1,200 an hour at that point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
also, Sarah Ray, um, before I let you go, I wanted to know, do you have any tips that you could share, uh, words of wisdom when it comes to utilizing tarot? I would say don't do it out of fear or desperation. Um, and that goes with any form of divination, whether it's just tarot or just trying to commune with spirit in general. You don't want to be coming from a place of fear or desperation. Like, I've noticed that a lot of people enter the spiritual world in a state of grief. You know, it's very tower energy where they're, um, they've just gone through a major shift or a lot of change immediately and they weren't ready for it. Um, or they think they weren't ready for it, rather. And so they're now they're starting to explore all these things from a, a place of fear and low vibrational energy. And you don't want to do that. You want to go into it um, ready to be uplifted. You know, if you really, if you just went through something crazy and you're ready to explore spiritual side of things or you feel like that is the next step, maybe it's better to start with a, getting a professional reading and then you can kind of ease into it because, that can really muddy up your reading. Like if you decide to just all of a sudden start pulling tarot cards for yourself and you're in the midst of grieving, you're not going to, first off, it's going to be really hard for you to interpret the messages because your mind is cloudy, right? Mm -hmm. And your heart is blocked. But secondly, it's going to be just, it's going to be overwhelming and you're going to be afraid like, oh my God, I I am grieving and I pulled a death card. (gasps) Oh no, which obviously the death card is not necessarily bad. So. Yeah, I definitely would want people to not begin from a low-level state of vibration. It's ideal if you could start from a higher-level state of vibration, and that can come from, you know, positive affirmations. Um, That can come from getting a professional reading that maybe someone can give you some tools, like you or I, give you some tools to where it can just be a better way to, to start. Speaking, speaking of going to you for tools, tell tell the Middleton Show fans how to reach you. Yeah, please do reach me. <laughs> the easiest way to find my world online is spirituallyinspired.co. You can see my readings there. I'm working on launching a shop as well with fun, pretty merchandise. Mm-hmm. And there, and all, all my books are there as well. Um so, yeah, spatialinspired.co. You can also message me on Instagram, if you're on Instagram, which is uh, spirit underscore inspo, because spiritually inspired was too long. <laughs> or you can send me an old-fashioned email at sararay at spatialinspired.co. That's, yeah, that's the best way to get into my world there, and I hope you do, because I would love to connect with you. <laughs> and please do connect with her. She is super fantastic. And... You, y'all can see her energy. She is so sweet. She is oh. magnificent, and she keeps it real. You can see how, and she's a loving mother, and oh. you can see yeah. how she, you know, interacts with, with Miss Evelyn over there, who I would love to interview. I'm not playing, Sarah Ray. You think I'm playing? I want to talk to Miss Evelyn and see how she feels about the world of metaphysics, and she probably has a lot to teach. <laughs> she knows she does. She came to us multiple times in spirit form letting us know she was coming before she actually came. So wow. she had lots of, and she's got nothing but water and earth in her chart. So she's wow. got a lot to say about metaphysics. <laughs> oh yeah, she's ready. I can't wait to see how she evolves. That'll be so awesome to witness. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. thank you, girl. I love you. I appreciate you. I can't yeah. wait to continue working with you in the future. And ladies and gentlemen this Sarah Ray. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you for having me. It's always such a joy to chat with you. Speaking of tarot, get to know tarot by registering for the Get to Know Tarot Workshop in January 2022. Receive your formal introduction to the world of tarot in this four-week workshop. Sign up today. You can also register for the one-day workshop on Discover Your Spiritual Gifts workshop in January 2022. Discover your particular spiritual gifts and how to develop and maintain them. So go to www.helpbyevina.com forward slash virtual workshops and you will be able to sign up for both of these workshops to get to know tarot and to get to know your spiritual gifts. 
Sign up today. Wasn't that fun? Did you learn anything? Did this episode stir up any questions, comments, or concerns? Send them over to me, Middleton at gmail.com or leave a message on our website at www.helpbyevina.com and I'll be more than happy to respond. Check out our bonus content by becoming a patron. There are four different patron tiers to choose from. This is to help upgrade our equipment. So, don't miss out on exclusive episodes and wonderful rewards for your patronage. If you're on Spotify, Podbean, Google Podcast, Amazon, or any other favorite podcasting platform, make sure you like The Me Middleton Show and leave a comment. Tell us how much you love the show, what you don't like about it, how we can improve, and how we can be challenged. If you're listening to The Me Middleton Show on YouTube, make sure you comment, like, click on the subscribe button, and the notification bell to be the first to get the newest episode. And remember, proper prior planning perfectly promotes persistent productivity and proud, pristine performances. Now, get out there and perform. Until next time.